welcome to the Tax Cast from the Tax Justice Network with me, Naomi Fowler. Coming up later, we look at our over reliance on unhelpful economic measures like gross domestic product, GDP. If you use GDP as it's currently measured in order to strengthen your economy, you'll make choices that, if you look at it closer, actually don't make sense. We'll have more on how that constrains our economic thinking later. There's no time in this month's tax cast to squeeze in any headlines, so we're going to go straight to John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network for his take on this month. Okay, John, this month we've had some terrible reminders of how climate breakdown is now upon us and our failure to rethink our economies in a sustainable way is uh, coming back to bite us, but obviously some people are paying a lot more for that than others. Terrible devastation from hurricanes in the Caribbean. When it comes to Britain's tax havens that have been devastated, Britain's obviously got a responsibility to come to the aid of uh, populations who on the whole are not wealthy people, despite the huge amount of money pouring in and out of those uh, locations through the financial sector. What does this tragedy tell us about the economic and social models that these places have been following all these years? Well, this year's hurricane season is more severe than most, but, but this is an area that's prone to hurricanes. And you'd have thought that the governments would have built financial resilience into their models, accepting that every now and then there's going to be devastation. You'd have thought that they would have built up some kind of funds to cover what must be deemed a contingent liability. But the truth of the matter is they haven't. To be honest, it's fine for the very rich people to live in these places and not pay taxes there or anywhere else. But it does mean that taxpayers elsewhere are inevitably being called upon every time there is some kind of humanitarian or developmental disaster. And of course, as humanitarians, we need to make this aid available and very quickly. But it does raise important matters of principle. Many of the affected islands have been tax havens for many, many years. British Virgin Islands, for example, and the Turks and Caicos Islands, both very badly hit by the hurricanes. But they attract millionaires and billionaires who don't want to pay tax anywhere. And because their business model is principally about not taxing rich people, these islands haven't built up any kind of financial resilience and they're not in a position where they can help either their communities or their economies when hurricanes inevitably come. So instead they're looking elsewhere for that kind of support. Because BVI is used by tax avoiders to deprive governments around the world of something in the order of 27 billion euro every single year, that's where the issue of principle comes in because the development model of the Caribbean tax haven islands is depriving other countries of the resources they need. And yet when the BBI and Turks and Caicos need humanitarian assistance, they look to taxpayers in other countries to help them. Right, and they say out of tragedy is born reform. These are huge disasters, obviously. They would always need outside help, but uh, how limited are they in um, what they could actually do to build up some better investment in the future, enabling them to be able to deal better with these disasters? You know, they are also quite big centres of insurance um, business themselves already, ironically. Yes. Well, I mean, given their very prominent roles as tax havens and as financial centres, you'd have thought they could actually take a leaf from the book of other tax havens, like the Channel Island of Jersey, for example, which over the years has built up what they call a rainy day fund. In other words, when disaster strikes, at least they have several hundred million set aside to help the local people re-establish their homes and their livelihoods and their businesses when disaster strikes. And in that respect, Jersey has been quite prudent. It's put the money aside. It's been careful not to dip into it for normal revenue spending. Yes, they are low taxes. It is a tax haven. But nonetheless, they have been building up revenues over many years precisely to cover these kind of contingencies. And it does seem to me the islands in the Caribbean need to learn from that. You don't even have to put in a very, very high tax base, but they've got enough rich people and certainly enough registered companies in the British Virgin Islands to start building up some kind of rainy day fund. Wealth disaster taxes. That's the one. (laughs) Well, that would be an interesting one. 
Okay, and we should give special mention to the British billionaire, Richard Branson, concerned environmentalist, former owner of the Virgin Airlines. <laughs> he sat out the hurricanes in his wine cellar. He's calling for a disaster recovery Marshall Plan for the British Virgin Islands. And this is the 324th wealthiest person in the world uh, with a net worth of about $5 billion. Yeah, I, I, I think it's very, very easy for billionaires to spend other people's money. They call for other taxpayers, typically much, much poorer people, to bail out communities where the very rich haven't actually been contributing to the communities themselves for decades. There's another concern around these disasters, and that's how somebody like President Trump might exploit these kind of weather shocks politically and economically. Naomi Klein's written about uh, what happened after Hurricane Katrina when uh, the US Vice President Mike Pence came up with a report called Pro-Free Market Ideas for Responding to Hurricane Katrina <laughs> and High Gas Prices. Another wave of danger coming against the public interest, things like uh, proposals for a flat tax free enterprise zones to supposedly encourage investment into the areas that have been hit, privatised disaster response, um, how to go about funding multi-billion dollar rebuild programmes. Uh, as they say, it's an ill wind that blows no one any good. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned Naomi Klein because her her work in this area, particularly the book The Shock Doctrine, kind of showed how every time there is some kind of disaster, the extreme libertarian right comes through with programmes for further rolling back on the state. And this raises questions because most people think that the role of the state is to protect them in key moments, particularly when they're disasters. But the rights programme in this area has been to neutralise the state so it's not a position to protect anybody. And then come the catastrophes, they move in and they buy up whatever's left standing. And I think this has got to be one of the biggest concerns for the ordinary people of the British Virgin Islands and the Turks and Caicos and wherever has been hit by hurricanes this season. If people are looking to the British government for support, they can expect a government that is ideologically inclined to help the very, very rich take over whatever is left standing after the hurricane. Right, and some of these lucrative contracts can actually swallow up some of the aid that is originally intended to help absolutely. the poorest, most affected people yeah, as well. And there's a track record here, particularly with British government aid. It very often is tied to UK contractors that will go in and at very, very vast expense, in, in many cases, simply take over the, and run and operate and profit from facilities that used to be part of the public service. Right. Let's move on to Bitcoin, because there's been some interesting developments around that this month. The value of Bitcoin took a big dive after being at record high levels earlier in the month. Very volatile. What we've seen is China making moves against um, Bitcoin. Uncertainty among governments about how they're going to treat cryptocurrencies. The head of JP Morgan has made a speech calling it all a fraud that's going to blow up. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily trust JP Morgan any more than uh, Bitcoin. Uh, but we haven't spoken much about Bitcoin on the tax cast. Um, what's your take on these latest developments? Well, um, when Bitcoin was first launched in 2009, it was promoted as, as a currency that could be created and controlled by its users for its users. There would be no single controlling entity like a central bank that could manipulate it and no third party entity like a government would be needed to intermediate and protect investors in the, in the currency. Now, when it was launched, the people who were promoting Bitcoin argued that the number of Bitcoins in circulation would be strictly capped at 21 million Bitcoins. That's it, globally. Forever. Forever. Now, at root, the founding vision of Bitcoin was ultra-libertarian, anti-state, driven by this worldview that uncontrolled money creation is the cause of inflation and economic instability, and elected politicians should be excluded from the whole process of currency management. Fast forward to the present, and we see a very different vision emerging of what Bitcoin is in reality. 
First of all, lots of other players are jostling in to the cryptocurrency market and all those dreams of creating a stable online money supply have disappeared. Within the Bitcoin community itself, there's now a huge argument going on about whether or not to double the money supply from 21 million to 42 million. And that would completely overthrow the idea that you need to have a limited stock. So we're already seeing that, that happen within the Bitcoin community, but other big players, including Facebook, are moving into the cryptocurrency area. Secondly, the Bitcoin promise of being a currency without government oversight has attracted all sorts of criminals and chances. You know, you've got drug dealers, arms traders, money launderers and tax cheats who love this currency. But perhaps most importantly, Bitcoin has proven to be totally unstable as a currency. Any objective assessment of its valuations in recent years would have to come to the conclusion that this is, this is a bubble. And the, the possibility of doubling the money supply to 42 million suggests that that's very possibly this is the, the, the point when this bubble is going to burst. Also, given that 10% of Bitcoin trading happens within the Chinese market, and after a long deliberation, the Chinese Internet Finance Association has just dismissed Bitcoin as lacking legal foundation. This could be the moment when that bubble really starts to, to collapse. The last thing the world needs at the moment is a highly secretive anti-government group of Bitcoin suppliers and Bitcoin users who think it's a good thing to operate beyond democratic or legal scrutiny. Right. And it's interesting which countries are sort of moving away from cryptocurrency trading and that kind of thing and which countries are quite attracted to it because Switzerland is being spoken about as the big hub of the future for cryptocurrencies. Switzerland, number one on the Financial Secrecy Index, uh, you know, rings some alarm bells. Absolutely. Switzerland's not alone in this amongst tax havens because I've talked to quite a few people in London who see that London could become a centre for Bitcoin trading. And I was in Jersey this month and I, I spoke to two or three people in Jersey in the finance industry, bankers, who were gung-ho for Bitcoin trading, even though they think the whole thing's something of a bubble. Yeah, interesting. I mean, there's some money to be made, but it's a bit like a fruit machine. You know, you might get lucky one day and you might be very unlucky the next day. One of the big arguments they make is, well, the regulated government sort of controlled markets have been fairly disastrous and cost us all a lot of money. So why is Bitcoin any less safe than uh, what we already have at the moment, which uh, is also prone to disastrous decision making and uh, criminal <laughs> activity? Well, I mean, the people who enthuse about Bitcoin tend to be very anti-government, and yet governments are under democratic control. There are people who are accountable to it. And the, the history of currencies over many, many decades, centuries, millennia, it's not that much of a disaster. We need money. It's right that money supply should be under some kind of democratic control. I, I think it's wrong, actually, for central bankers to be largely responsible for, for money supply uh, decisions. It, it should be something taken on by government, and governments should be responsible to the people. Nobody knows who's behind Bitcoin. Nobody knows who's manipulating it. What we do know is that many of the so-called Bitcoin miners, those are the people who are actually creating the Bitcoins through online activity, they are largely big-time players working on the internet. These are not lots and lots of cottage industry people slavering over tiny machines. There is a tendency towards oligopolistic control. I think that the idea that this could eventually be a some kind of replacement for the dollar or for the euro is to completely misunderstand the importance of democratic government. Yeah, and also they then can't be hoping for bailouts when it all goes wrong. Absolutely. No government anywhere in the world should underpin the risks involved. Bitcoin users and all other cryptocurrency users must understand they're operating outside democracy, they're outside state control. They cannot look to other taxpayers to bail them out. Absolutely not under any circumstance. So uh, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. I think in some respects it's just another black economy device, a bit like bearer shares and so on, which the wealthy will use to evade paying taxes.
It is so prone because of its secrecy to being misused for drugs, transactions, weapons, transactions, all sorts of nasty stuff. And the, the, the Bitcoin users, but above all the Bitcoin suppliers, say we're not responsible for this. Of course they are. Thanks, John. John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network. Now it's time for the TaxCast special feature. We've talked many times on the TaxCast about rethinking economics. This month, we look at how the measurements we use that have dominated economic thinking for so long don't tell us the whole story, and how some of the methods we use to measure our economic progress as nations are actually constraining us. Kicking off this month's tax cast, here's Bobby Kennedy back in 1968, criticising the inadequacy of GDP as a measure of a nation. Our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud that we are Americans. <laughs> Hard to imagine a prominent politician these days identifying the shortcomings of economic data like that. Professor of Political Arithmetic at the University of Amsterdam, Daniel Mugger. I think the interesting question is, how come we still care so much about GDP? Since day one, so if we go back to the 1930s and 1940s, and you know one of the grandfathers of GDP, there were several, but one of them was Simon Kuznets, who worked for the National Bureau of Economic Research in the United States. He said from the very beginning that what at the time was still called national income was a poor gauge for the overall welfare of a nation. GDP and its precursors were fairly narrow economic measures that try to say something about the size of the money economy, not more, not less than that. And not for a moment should we think that being able to measure that would tell us something about the overall state of a country. And the funny thing then is that even though that disclaimer was there from day one, time and again, people seem to forget journalists, policymakers, citizens, academic economists seem to forget that those two are two different things. Yes, business and finance journalists rely on these measures all the time, every day in their reporting on the economy, and they're so much a part of the way we think. It's easy to forget how recently the concept of the economy even started. Yes, uh, it's even the history about the idea of the economy itself. It's something, you know, a term that wasn't used really before the 1930s, so it was only in the 1930s in the context of the New Deal in the United States and heavy government intervention in Western Europe in particular, that people start talking about the economy as something that needed to be managed and maybe could be managed and that should be the object of political and policy manipulation. And so it's interesting that before then people would talk about political economy or about specific things like trade or unemployment or inflation, but not about the economy as this supposed entity that's just sitting out there. And what's the impact of the way that we measure our economies? What do these measures leave out? Well, on the one hand, using a particular measure affects us all because it steers the whole ship in potentially an undesirable direction. And then there are other dimensions of economic measurement that indeed are distributive. They benefit some and they hurt others. I think the most obvious example concerns GDP statistics, which ignore many things that are dear to us. So things that we value, but that are disregarded in these statistics are in particular the use of natural resources, and that can be you know, the cutting down of forests or the using of fossil fuels, but also depletion of fish stocks in the ocean, these sorts of things. So something can look like economic growth, even though it's built on an environmentally and even economically unsustainable business model, as it were, because it's built on depleting a stock of something that eventually is simply going to be gone. On the other hand, there are things that we actually think are pretty good, 
things would, for example, include, say, voluntary labor, uh, helping your neighbor, um, many other ways of, you know, within the context of the family, for example, assisting each other or, you know, labor being performed that is disregarded by GDP. And what are the consequences of that on the decisions our governments make? What that means is if we think that we want to strengthen our economy and the way we do that is we think of policies that would have a positive impact on GDP readings, we might end up doing things that indeed boost the GDP reading but actually are detrimental in the longer run because they damage our environment. And we wouldn't do things which we actually think have a positive impact, for example, encouraging people to share things, to help each other out, all these sorts of things, but that, that don't show up in the GDP reading. If you use GDP as it's currently measured in order to strengthen your economy, you'll make choices that, if you look at it closer, actually don't make sense. It's also quite surprising what you say about the way different countries compile their GDP figures, which aren't necessarily harmonised and even where they are contexts are so different that comparisons between countries don't necessarily tell us what we think they do. Yes. Uh, so in principle, many countries around the world, or actually most of them have signed up to the system of national accounts, which is the standard way of calculating, among other things, your GDP, but also things like government debt and a few few other of these things. Now, as it turns out, the devil is often in the detail. Now, there are different versions of the system of national accounts out there. And certainly for poorer countries, you know, you'll find that, say, in countries in sub-Saharan Africa, many of them will have a very hard time implementing the newest version of these standards. And so they'll be using something that's from the early 90s, if not from the late 60s. But even then, you find that if you have countries that actually differ in their actual economic makeup, then using the one and the same standard can actually generate, as it were, sort of like mock comparability. Let me give you an example. There are quite a few services or forms of labor that used to be performed within households, particularly by women, that were not counted. Cooking, care for children, care for older people, cleaning the house, all these sorts of things. Now, in some countries, it's been the case that people who could afford it have started buying these kinds of services on the market, you know, somebody to clean your house, somebody to take care of older people, certainly somebody to take care of your children, you know, buying food that's delivered to your door, these sorts of things, such that women could enter the labor market. What that means is that now the labor is divided differently across different groups of society. That country's GDP may actually look bigger, bigger, even though the labor has been moved around the economy rather than created out of nowhere. In a nutshell, countries where many domains of life are highly marketized, where there's money flowing through all aspects of our lives, they all have on paper pretty big GDP. In countries where a lot of labor is performed without money changing hands, on paper they'll look a lot smaller and poorer, even though the same kind of work gets done. Right, and that brings me to the question of how we conceptualize what real value actually is? What GDP measures is monetary flows and values. It's not originally interested or it doesn't actually measure value in where it's created. You know, it measures prices that are being paid for different goods and services, assuming that those prices mirror the value of different products or services that are being traded. Turns out that that is quite a dubious assumption to make. Um, you know, it could very well be that, you know, some services or products are able to fetch pretty high prices, not because there's a lot of inherent value, but because the company that's providing these services or these products is actually in a position, for example, because it has a monopoly or because it's tricked everybody into buying this stuff with lots of advertising, that it's able to fetch high prices in the market even though many people would agree that actually there is not all much value in them. Um, That becomes particularly relevant when you have products where the production is distributed over different countries. And we ask the question, you know, say the production of an iPhone or of a sneaker or something like that, you know, which country contributes what chunk to the production of a sneaker, let's say. And what you may then find is that, you know, because a lot of the money is captured by companies that are located in rich, normally Western, European or North American countries because they actually earn the money with it, 
there's a presupposition, they're also the value creators. But of course, you could very easily ask whether the fact that they're able to squeeze Chinese or Vietnamese labor to make these sneakers for rock bottom prices and then pocket all the cash themselves, so the Adidas's or Nikes of this world, whether that reflects actual value creation or says more something about, you know, smart business strategies on their behalf where they're able to rake in as much profits as they can. And so it's easy to mistake GDP figures, which are effectively about capturing money, with figures that say something about real value creation. Sometimes the two may be close to each other, but not necessarily. Right. And when it comes to the costs to society of certain industries, financially or economically, GDP can't incorporate that into how it measures things like the City of London's finance sector. As we know, there are all sorts of claims about the contribution of banking to the GDP of countries everywhere. Well, see, the thing is, there is a lot of money being earned in the city. And I think it is fair to say that, you know, whether these services are always services or disservices, I think that's often an open question. But that, of course, is very different than saying something about the general positive impact that the presence of something like the City of London has on the UK economy as a whole. That, of course, if we consider the actual costs that financial services sector malfunctioning has brought upon our societies and economies, Over the past, it's been 10 years now since the global financial crisis, a lot of the costs of an excessively large financial sector, the displacement effect that that has had on other branches of economic activity, manufacturing in particular, or that has generated a certain kind of neglect for other sectors of the UK economy, certainly the costs of the broader economic downturn that we've seen after the global financial crisis a lot of which was born, you know, simply by households and their living standards, but also by the public purse and, you know, the systemic instability that that has brought. And still, because it's been able to earn a lot of money, the financial sector may show up as something that's contributing positively to GDP. And that seems like a serious mischaracterization of how positive or otherwise the financial sector is for our individual countries. What kind of economic measures do you think would be more useful to us than the ones we seem to be so over-reliant on? I think that there are many dimensions to what we think makes our societies livable and what important dimensions of living standards of their citizens are. For the moment, I'm not convinced that it would be useful to try to devise a single indicator that somehow would capture all the things like you know, individual freedoms, gender equality, the leisure time people have, the sustainability of their growth model, all these sorts of things. And I think rather what what you want is a fairly broad monitoring, whether we're moving in directions that we as societies find desirable. Over the past decade or so, actually quite a few people have been working on these things, and not only at the fringes of civil society and the fringes of academia, But, for example, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, has launched a few years ago something called a Better Life Index, which you can find online on their website. And there it has scored the member countries of the OECD, so something like 34, 35 countries, along a range of different dimensions. So these are things, again, about education, leisure time, security, security in the labor market, these sorts of things. And then you as an individual can adjust on that website yourself how important you find these different dimensions of welfare and societal well-being. And it will then present to you, the website that is, how the different countries fare with respect to your personal preference profile. I think actually that the focus on GDP is the function of the fact that our economic models and economic growth models require to a certain extent that there is continuing growth of this money economy. The other thing there is that in a day and age in which automation basically means that there are fewer and fewer jobs out there, of course, this whole logic that you say we need economic growth to compensate for job losses, those ideas only make sense if you stick with a current economic model. If you had something where you say, well, we want to share labor throughout the economy in a much more fair and equal way. And we don't leave it to the quote unquote market. We don't leave it to just the most powerful economic players anymore. And we also start thinking very differently. Then maybe the need for this kind of economic growth wouldn't actually be so pronounced. 
I've been talking to Professor of Political Arithmetic at the University of Amsterdam, Daniel Mugger. For more on his work, go to www.fickleformulas.org. Plenty more work and more visionary thinking to be done on our economic realities. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next month. Thank <laughs> you.